concussions. Unfortunately, a few years ago, I had to experience something like this with my younger son. He wasn't three at the time. He was up on a dock 10 to 15 feet high and fell off. And on the way down, of course, he couldn't just hit the water. His head bounced off of the side of a boat and then a steel ladder. And he hit the water, and we were right there. But, and we were terrified. But what we come to find out was that there was no way to test him. There's no way to test a three-year-old. And there's no way to test somebody after the fact to find out if they're getting better or if they ever got better. That's a problem. So if I asked everybody, what sport has the most concussions? Most people would probably say maybe football, hockey, rugby, depending on the country. What if I told you that for many age groups, it's cheerleading? Another one that's oftentimes above football is soccer. And women's soccer has more concussions than men's soccer. How could that be? So a very small amount of anatomy. The brain is essentially floating inside of the skull. And when the person is moving at high speeds and stops suddenly, physics says the brain will keep moving. And it smashes into the inside of the skull and then kind of bounces back. So it's like two wrecking balls smashing into the brain, causing what we call a concussion. So for today, we're going to put concussions into real three areas, three categories. The first category are concussions that are very obvious. Anyone in this room could say, yeah, that person is concussed. Those are the easy ones. The second group, you may not see any outward symptoms, but they're telling you what's wrong with them. They're telling you that they have a headache and they're nauseous and they're dizzy. Third group is the problem child. That's the group that you don't see anything and they don't tell you anything's wrong. So now you're expected to detect the undetected. And that's really hard. Now, who wouldn't tell you something was wrong? Why wouldn't they say anything? Well, so last year there were about 4 million concussions that were reported. And reported's the key word. So two-thirds of those concussions were under 18. Vast majority are going to be high school. So they did a poll of thousands of 14 to 18 year old high school students, male and female athletes. And they asked them anonymously, have you ever had a concussion and not said anything about it? Over 60% said yes. They had had a concussion that they knew about and didn't say anything about it. And so they went a step further and they said, why? Why didn't you say anything about that? And they pretty much got one answer. It was, I didn't want to come off the field. I didn't want to lose potential of a scholarship. I didn't want to disappoint my team. And at 18 years old, that kind of makes sense. So there's got to be a better way. Well, it turns out currently, all of the approved methods of testing for a concussion are subjective. They have human interpretation to be able to tell, which automatically introduces bias. Some of the techniques were designed in the 1970s, asking a math problem, having them repeat the months of the year backwards. Try that with a three-year-old. One of them is reading and writing. They put you in a room with a pencil and paper and you read and answer questions. Another has a screen right up to your face, and you watch a bouncing ball. What do they say if you have a concussion? Don't read and write. 
and don't look at a computer screen. And that's how they're testing you. There's got to be a better way. About six years ago, a neurologist was seeing patients, and she thought that when people would come in with a head injury, she thought she noticed that their blink just looked a little different. So she got with a mechanical engineer, and they built this beauty of a device. Now, this weighs almost 100 pounds. It's a 40-pound computer and a full-size air compressor down at the bottom. But what they were able to do is validate an idea. And the idea is that a, the person puts their face into the part at the top there, and it puffs a small amount of air on the corner of their eyes. And there's a high-speed camera inside, and it's watching for the time it takes for your blink reflex to happen. Now, blink reflex, we all have it. It's innate, it's automatic, you're born with it, something touches your eyelash, you will blink. So there's no way to cheat it. There's no way around it. You can detect it whether the person's telling you something's wrong or not. Now, based on this technology, on the blink idea, my team was also working on something with the brain. And what we were working on was a little different. We wanted to shrink it down to a smaller device. And we looked at something called nerve conductance. We're looking at the health and speed of the signal down the nerve and back from the eye to the brain stem and back to the eye. And we thought, what if we could put these two together? So we did that. We were able to get it down to four and a half pounds. Everything you saw in that last one and more is in here. So we don't use an air compressor. We use food grade CO2. You can get approximately 100 participants with this and it costs less than a dollar. And we don't use a 40 pound desktop computer. You can look at everything with that. It fits in my, my, in my back pocket. That's pretty amazing. Here's how it works. So some awesome software is tracking the eyes. So a puff of air is occurring on the corner of the eyes, five of them, over 20 seconds. And in almost real time, it's tracking the upper eyelid. So the 20 seconds you just saw, 12,000 pictures were just taken. Those 12,000 pictures are then looked at by the computer in my back pocket and is able to look at them in seconds and decide exactly where the eyelid is. And so it can tell down to a thousandth of a second, one millisecond, if there's a difference. And it turns out from our huge study of thousands of people, there are differences. Now, had I had that with my son, we'd be in a very different place. I would have known if he was getting better, except what we were seeing. I also would have known if he ever got back to where he was before. I'll never know that. I'll never know if he has any lasting effects. Now we will. Now we have where he is today. And as a five-year-old now, it will happen again. And now we can test it. No one is immune to a concussion. It can happen driving in a car. You can fall off a dock. You could be bedridden and fall out of bed. And knowing and detecting these ahead of time is important because then you can treat it the right way. Without knowing, you can't treat it. And the lasting effects we're seeing in the media. But now I'm excited to be able to tell you 
that we're able to now detect these in the blink of an eye. Thank you.